Thanks for joining me on Conversations. I'm John Bradshaw. My special guest today is an author, a teacher, a preacher, a missionary, and a lifelong student of the Word of God. Originally from Syria, now in the United States for some years, Dr. Philip Saman. Dr. Saman, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. It's a blessing to have you here, and I can't wait to dig a little bit into your life story. Originally from Syria, where, and of course I'm going to ask that very general question, what was that like? Well, I was born in Syria on the coast, a small town between the cities of Banias and Tartus. So it's the, the Mediterranean coast in Syria. Exactly. Sounds perfect. And I grew up on a farm. What so kind of I farm? love nature. We grew all kinds of crops right on the sea. So the sea is a part of my life. So whenever I find water, I love it. So growing up in Syria, uh, there are not that many people watching right now who can picture a, a, a life on a Syrian farm. So to explain that to me. Describe to me what life was like as a, as a child growing up in Syria. Well, we have the sea and the fertile land and the mountains. And we grow all kinds of crops because we have four seasons. So every season we have crops to grow and we grew our own food. So as a child, a lot of time working on the farm. A lot of time. What do you do? What, what are Syrian kids? What did Syrian kids do at their spare time? Well, Syrian kids were put to work and disciplined and taught the value and importance of work. So I'm very thankful my dad taught me how to work from an early age. That's why I happen to be persistent and very hardworking. You spent your working life in ministry, teaching, a pastor, a lot of time in writing, served as a missionary. As a child, was there anything about you that suggested to others you would end up in ministry? Or was there anything that suggested to you when you were a kid that your life was going to be spent in service to God? From the very beginning, even at the age of four and five, I was convicted by the Lord, I'm going to spend my time ministering, serving Him and other people. That never changed. And so, uh, to just tell you a little bit about that experience, even when I learned how to read in Arabic my Bible, which was at the age of eight, I would get up in the morning around four o'clock and put on the kerosene lamp and read and devour the Bible. And I remember my dad getting up at six to go to work. Son, have you been awake all this time to study your Bible? Yes, because I love Jesus and his word. So even with that, I knew that I was very passionate about ministry. Who was it who placed that in you? Now, the Spirit of God, clearly. But did you have a, a mentor, a family member, a relative that encouraged you to think about a future in ministry? My dad and my mom were very spiritual people, very honest, dedicated people. And they instilled that in me, and I kind of followed their example. Plus, they named me Philip because they wanted me to be an evangelist. So they kept praying for me. I'd be like Philip, the evangelist. So here I am. Tell me about how you transitioned into ministry. Well, you know, I came to the United States. You came here to study, didn't you? To study for the ministry. And I was a student at Walla Walla College in the state of Washington. I was very involved on campus in doing ministry, getting the students involved in Bible studies, in witnessing, and then during the Christmas breaks, I felt impressed to go and conduct events to meetings. I would organize my fellow students and go to neighboring towns to conduct evangelistic meetings. And I still remember the first one was in Baker, Oregon. The second was in Salmon, Idaho, in the bad. middle of winter. You know, there the winter is different than the sea. I mean, there's ice and snow, but we felt convicted to spend our Christmas breaks to be evangelists. What do you remember about those evangelistically driven Christmas breaks? Oh, it was exciting because Christmas was about sharing Jesus and his message. And so during Christmas, that's what we're doing. It's a good way to spend your Christmas break. Was it a challenging time? Did you see results from your labors? Did you talk to me about we, that? We saw results uh, in, in both ways. It was an encouragement to our church members to review their precious distinctive teachings from the Bible. Plus other people would come. And they would come and would learn about the truth as it is in Jesus, and they would get born again and baptized. You ended up doing a number of things in ministry. You started as a pastor. You, you, not, not that you, you recently retired as a college professor, but I don't think 
you and retirement are really going to get along that well. Did you know then, did you feel then that you'd end up in one type of ministry or another, or was it just ministry and God will lead me? Just ministry and God would lead me. And that's why my ministerial experience is so varied and interesting and exciting because the Lord led me to do all kinds of different things. Okay, you started off in ministry uh, after college as a local church pastor. That's right. Okay. Now, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to come back to this again and again as we talk, but by that time, when you became a local church pastor, how many years had you been in the United States? Well, um, probably about, I would say, eight years. So you were still a pretty Syrian, sort of a Syrian. Yeah, if you put it that way, yeah, I agree I mean, with you, yes. I mean, you're going to tell me now you're still a Syrian Syrian, but you've been in this country, you know, three times longer than you were in Syria or thereabouts. So. I left when I was a teenager. Yeah. And now I'm 69. So you go and figure. Yes. Yeah, Most of my life was spent in this country. Sure. So you'd been here relatively few years. Yes. And then you were placed in a local congregation to be yes. a church pastor. Yes. So I want to ask you generally about pastoral ministry and how you enjoyed it, what the challenges were. But first, I want to ask you what it was like being a Syrian, a, f a foreigner, whatever that might be, uh, only in this country for a few years and being the shepherd to American sheep. What was that like? Yeah, not only American sheep in general, American sheep in the cowboy country of Idaho. And there was, we didn't have many foreigners and they never met a Syrian before. This so, is about a, a million miles yes, from the yes, coast, the yes. Mediterranean coast of Syria. So I always humored them by saying, you know, the cowboys needed a missionary from Syria and they would laugh at that. <laughs> but it was an exciting experience. You know, when you love people, respect people in Jesus, they love you back. And that was a very meaningful experience for me as I start my ministry. Let me ask States. you this question. I didn't even think of asking you this question, but I'll ask you this now. As a Middle Easterner who'd come to the United States, did you ever experience racism? Well, you know, John, racism is everywhere, more or less. And I sense that sometimes, but I focused on the opposite. Loving people, befriending people, that if there was any residue of prejudice or racism, like it just disappeared. And did that work? Yes. Yes, it worked. Because, you know, you, you just have to focus on what is important and crucial in ministry. And some of this, be it that or be it other things, you just have to um, leave to the side. Because, you see, when you focus on what's important, it maximizes what's important, it minimizes what's not important. That, that's what happens. Pastoral ministry. You came to pastoral ministry in your 20s. And now you're, you're shepherding these uh, cowboy sheep. Yes. Tell me a bit about your experience in pastoral ministry. How did you enjoy that? You mentioned, you say cowboy sheep. I, I would describe you're in, them as you're maybe... In cowboy country. Yeah, well, I would describe them as sheep, but as like strong oxen, strong bulls with horns. But it, was, it, it just helped me to be challenged and be stronger to join them. And so... To me, you know, in some countries, people uh, are viewed as sheep because they follow. Whatever you tell them, they appreciate. You say yes, and they say yes. But, you know, in America, people are independent. They have a mind of their own. So you have to use the special gifts God's given you to be able to win their trust and let them rally behind your leadership. What were the special joys of pastoral ministry for you? The special joys, I can tell you without thinking, is to love people in Jesus, to win their trust, to, um, to see them be transformed by the power of God and become a new creation in Jesus. That's the most exciting thing. You know, I mean, the greatest accomplishment we can have as ministers is to lead people to salvation. Ministry can be a real challenge. Yes. And uh, we hear of pastors leaving ministry and we're not surprised. We may be a little sorry, but we're not surprised. People leave all, all forms of employment, whatever it is. But pastors leave ministry and sometimes because the going is tough and the challenges become a bit much. What would you say to pastors or anyone involved in ministry who's just a little discouraged and struggling? I meet, I meet people like that. 
and ministry is tough. To me, it's the most challenging kind of work we have. But you see, the message we have, the Lord we serve is so, so wonderful that we have the answer to people's problems. And that in itself carries you through. I mean, I mean, who else has the message that Jesus solves the most difficult problems? You know, our, our most crucial problems are sin and death. And Jesus provides his righteousness in the place of our sin and his life instead of our death. Isn't that so exciting? Yeah, it is. That no matter how it is. challenging it is, we got the answers in Jesus. And it becomes so exciting that people rally with you and get excited with you. It depends what we focus on. Do you think pastoral ministry has become more challenging as the years have gone by? I think it has become more challenging year after year. I notice that all the time when I visit churches every weekend. Why? Because the world is becoming more problematic. Uh, young people face issues we never faced. Each year, especially as I teach, for the past 30 years, students come to me with more complicated problems. So I really feel we need to pray a lot for our young people because they're facing so many challenges young people never faced before. Give me an example of what some of those might be. Well, I mean, all kinds of abuse, okay? It's so hard to hear. Uh, if I were not a pastor, I would not want to hear it. Plus peer pressure, plus the internet, sin is becoming so marketable, available. It's very hard for young people to resist. That's why leading to Jesus, anchor them in Jesus, is the only answer. It's everywhere now, isn't it? I it mean, is it, everywhere. It, it used to be that sin may not have flourished here or there, but now with the advent of mobile devices and the internet, sin can go anywhere you can and can reach you wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And people make it easier f for even their children to sin. I know students I lead to Jesus become convert, excited about witnessing. Can you believe it, John? The parents call me and say, my, my kid is too spiritual. Please let him enjoy life for a while before he gets converted. Believe it or not, people actually call me about that. I said, you should be happy that your son, your daughter, are excited about Jesus and living a spiritual life. No, no, but that's too much for them. They're too young. So some of these kids, you know what they tell me? They tell me, Dr. Saman, my parents make it too easy for me to sin. And our job as teachers and parents and pastors is to make it very difficult for them to sin, Amen. just do the opposite. Yeah, that's right. Yee, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it? Somebody calling the college to complain their kid is too spiritual. <laughs> you experience everything. Uh, and not, not many, but I mean, once in a while sure, you hear it. Yes, yeah. because after all, my, my daughter, my son are so young and they should really enjoy life before they make commitment to Jesus. And I say, you know, real joy in life is in finding Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Yeah. Because they, they're focusing on having fun, you know, when they're young. But to me, this is what I call fake fun. Like we say fake news, fake fun. But the fun you have in Jesus is real and authentic. So let me talk about that to you. You, 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 you come from, from Syria. Let me ask you this. At the time, was Syria uh, dealing with poverty or was it plenty? What was the Syria like that you left behind? Was it, was life Tough for the average person? Oh, not so tough. It was, it was bearable. It wasn't too tough, too easy. Somewhere in the middle. Okay, okay. Because people had their farms, their businesses, and they managed. Let me ask you a practical question. So you come here as a young person, you're a Christian, you, you went to college and you studied, you had Christian friends, you're involved in ministries. Uh, uh, many people might look at people like you or me and say, it's got to be the most boring person in the world because they don't do this and don't do that and don't do that and what... What, what do they even do to enjoy life? So talk to me about, about, what, about an enjoyable life for a young person. And because a young person says, oh, he's telling me to live for Jesus, then I shouldn't, shouldn't, cannot, cannot, must not, must not, must not. How does a young person, considering giving his or her life to Jesus, look at what might be here and say, that's what I really want, rather than say, how can I possibly live without A, B, or C? Mm -hmm. Well, we mentioned so many negatives, you know. I can't do this, I can't do that, I must not do this, right. I must do that. But, but the focus should be, what can I do? What can, what can I do for Jesus? What can I do for other people? And I could list you so many things, positive things, 
uh, uh, that would make us very happy and have real fun. But, but you see, sometimes we present to people, you can't do this, you can't do that. And so if you don't have Jesus, well, you do nothing. But if you have Jesus, he is so creative and he's so vibrant. There are so many things he will inspire to do. And it gives you the most enjoyable life you have. So to me, the, 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 the first and foremost thing I need to do is to lead people to Jesus. You know, release them to the embrace of Jesus. And then he'll take care of them in a very exciting way. I mean, I look back to my life, as you mentioned, you know, that I'm retired. I'm not really retired, you know, because I'm still active. Sure. Maybe I'm more busy than ever before. But you know something? All these years of my life, it has been the most exciting. I can sit here and testify to that because it's true. The joy that Jesus gives you from serving him and walking with him, you cannot compare to anything else. But you have to experience it first to know what I'm talking about. Now, of course, I ask the question the way I ask the question, how can adults, parents, grandparents, teachers, mentors, present Christianity to young people who are, who are overwhelmed in many cases with temptation in a way that it's positive and not don't do this and you must do that? How do we present Christianity to young people to make it positive? By providing a good example. If you really believe Jesus gives you genuine fun, am I seeing you having real fun? If you think Jesus gives you joy, real joy, he, he plants joy in your heart, puts a smile upon your face. If I see that demonstrated, then I will think about it seriously. But we cannot just be talking about it and not living it. Jesus is not someone you profess from the mouth. He's someone you possess in your heart. So if it's only a profession, it will make a difference. We have to possess what we talk about. I was having this conversation just last night, but from a different perspective. I was raised as a Roman Catholic. My dad would have loved for me to have been a priest. But I looked at the priests we had and I said, I don't want to be that. Boring, no fun. It just didn't look like a life. And I said to whoever it was I was talking to, if we'd had a young, vibrant, energetic priest who was having a great life, I may well have become a priest. Well, I experienced the same thing you did, John, because when I look, you look at the Catholic priest, you said, I look at the Greek Orthodox priest, they're similar. And I said, I don't want to be that. I do not want to do that. And I wrestled with God for a while. Lord, I want to serve you, but I want to serve you like that. And even not just looking at Sometimes pastors, they have a kind of a boring life because to them it's a job, it's not a ministry. And I said, Lord, please show me how can I have an exciting ministry? And I will say yes. And he showed me that and he convicted me he's going to prepare me for an exciting ministry. Okay. I said, I'll do it. And now I look back at the last 45 years of ministry. I say, he fulfilled his promise to me. We'll talk about some more of that ministry. Ministry doesn't have to be boring. No, it, it, it shouldn't be. It should, it, in fact, if you love God and love what you're doing, it cannot possibly Ordal, be. Ordal, you know why? Because Jesus is exciting, and if He lives in your life, He will express Himself through you. That's right. We'll talk more about this in a moment. My guest is Dr. Philip Saman, and we'll be right back. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv.
Welcome back to Conversations. I'm John Bradshaw. My guest is Dr. Philip Saman, who throughout his career in ministry has done just about everything, including spending many years as a college professor. Now, after pastoral ministry, it's my understanding, Dr. Saman, you ended up getting into youth ministry, not teaching on college campuses, but ministry on college campuses. So how did that come about? And did you feel like this is this this worked naturally for you or was it a, a transition? Well, you know, my focus of ministry wasn't just about the local church, my church. It was doing my best to impact the community. So I began to reach out to community colleges, uh, public universities, academies, high schools, just as a natural part of reaching as many people as possible. At the North Pacific Union, the president wanted to have somebody to lead out in campus ministries and youth outreach. So he learned that I was doing this anyway as part of my overall ministry. And so he called me to the North Pacific Union to minister to students on our campuses, like nine academies, Walla Walla College, and the public universities. So that's how I started with youth ministry. So what was, what was that like? Was, that, was it a, a difficult challenge? Were, were young people responsive? Well, it depends how you look at it. Some people say you cannot preach students on public university campuses because they are not responsive. So the way I start, I start small. I always start small and meet the few Adventist students on campus. And because the way we interact, the quality time we spend together, the word gets around before you know it. You have 50, 100, 150, 200 people meeting. So it just depends how we start. We start the right way, Christ's way, and then we start small. And we provide quality contacts, and this then spreads. I want to talk to you about youth ministry. What do we have to do to keep our kids in the church, or at least to give ourselves the best possible chance to keep our children and not watch them walk away from church and walk away from Jesus. You know, research at Southern Adventist University School of Religion showed what you're saying is true. Many of our graduates leave the church after they graduate. Can you imagine these kids attending our schools from grade one and now they finish college? And they leave the church. What are we doing wrong? Okay, so that's the question. Why do you think that's happening? I believe it's happening because we need to involve our young people in a cause bigger than themselves. That youth ministry is not about entertainment because they find enough entertainment in the world. And I very much like what the youth director of the General Conference said when he came to speak at Southern. He said, it is not anymore youth entertaining, but youth training. I like these two words. It's not entertaining, it's training. And I believe training young people to experience the joy and excitement of serving the Lord, reaching out to people, believing in a cause bigger than themselves, get them involved in a mission, let them see how God is real in their lives as a minister to others. I believe if we invest in that, that will keep them loyal to Jesus and loyal to his people, loyal to his church. Now, here's what we know. In many cases, getting the kids involved is asking the children to take up the offering once a month Mm -hmm. or maybe asking that nice girl who plays the piano to provide music for church once in a great while. But you're talking about something much bigger than that. Much bigger, much bigger. Uh, Not everybody can play the piano. Uh, Not everybody can can sing, for example, or preach. So we have to help our young people discover what their spiritual gifts are. I mean, everybody got some gifts to focus on that, to let them know how God's gifted them and provide effective ways to help them practice their gifts and and let them experience success. Start with something small and doable and let them experience success. I mentioned one of them. When I take my students to the nursing home, local nursing homes, it's a simple activity. They might bring a guitar, a smile, and when they realize how meaningful it is to talk to older people and how older people appreciate them so much, they're hooked. They want to do it again. That's a simple thing, doable thing, but they experience success and feel needed. But churches have a real problem with young people. Let me tell you what it is. Some of these young people, they show up to church, they might have an earring in their ear. 
Oh, I've been to churches, you know, Dr. Saman, and the boy was there and his hair was blue. Or the boy grew his hair long. Or the girl shaved her head. I mean, Dr. Saman, what are we going to do when we have young people like this? What these kids need the least is for them to be condemned. They need to be appreciated and cherished because no matter how they look like, the investment of Jesus' life is in each one of them, and that gives them a lot of self-worth. When I look at people like this, I see Jesus invested in them. How can you give up on them? There was a young man like this who became like a hippie, body piercings, part of his head was green, the other part of his hair was blue, a sight to behold. Sure. So he was gone out of the church for three years. There were all kinds of crazy things. And now the Lord convicted his heart to come back home, to come back to the fold. And this dear saint who was, who was a greeter, no. she, meant, she meant well. You She's trying to be helpful. You don't want to say. And she said, No way. Sonny, she called him Sonny, where have you been all of this? And by the way, don't you know when you come to church, you should look presentable? Now, she meant well by that. I'm not trying to condemn her or judge her. Ouch. This young man left and never came back. I tried to reach him. This has been many years. He said, I'll never go back. He made a commitment never to come back because how he was welcome when he came back. So we have to be very Christ-like and look at each person like that and value them as we would value Jesus and as much as we do it to him, we do it to Jesus. What do you think Jesus would do if, if he was in the synagogue? Okay, not the synagogue, in the church, and a girl came in with a ring in her nose, and a boy came in with a <clears throat> chain around his neck and long hair. I'm just picking on stereotypical yes. things. What would, what would Jesus do well, if a bunch of kids like that showed up at his church? We know what he would do, don't we? I mean, after all, he had, and he was condemned for it, by the way, he was around harlots, prostitutes, tax collectors. People with real issues. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather have a guy with an earring and have a tax collector, uh, you know, just, just cheating from people big time. I mean, you know, we should look at things in certain perspectives. And to me, to have somebody looking a certain way could be easier than dealing with some of the people Jesus dealt with. We just have to look at the potential and ask the question, how would these people be when they really turn to Jesus? Isn't it important that we see things in perspective? Some of the things that some of the saints give young people a hard time about are pretty small. I'm not excusing silly behavior or unwise behavior, but in the grand scheme of things, we can get pretty well exercised over things that in the big picture just don't mean a lot. That's right. See, I don't like some of that myself. I recall coming to church, I was, I was holding meetings in British Columbia, and there was a young fellow whose name I don't remember, he was 22 or something, looked about 22 years of age. And we come to church and his hair is blue, bright blue. And a uh, couple of dear old ladies walked in behind me and I thought, oh, this will be interesting. And they said, hello, Rodney, or whatever his name was, blue hair. What do you think, Edith? Oh, I like it. Although Edith said, but Rodney, I did like the green. I liked the green very much. <laughs> they just loved him anyway. Yes. He, he never left the church. F finally figured out what he wanted to do with his hair. Yes. If we see all of that from Christ's perspective, you see, we focus on what we think is important. If I focus on the color of the hair and all the body piercing, then that's what's important to me. That's a priority. But isn't that a greater priority? It's a greater priority. It goes beyond that to the salvation of this precious person whom, in whom Jesus invested his life-giving blood. If you focus on that, then this doesn't become a big issue. And to me, the young people or anybody else should never think of us as that's our focus. That's what we're in love with. They should think about us being in love with Jesus. And then, to me, the greatest have to give them is to love them unconditionally in Jesus, and what's supposed to fall off will fall off. But even if it takes them longer, what choice do we have but love them unconditionally? Jesus would do that. Remember, Jesus loved people to the end. He even loved Judas to the end. That's right, he did.
and he loved the people who said crucify him to the very end when he was agonizing on the cross. And he prayed for them. And believe it or not, after the Pentecost, at the spirit anointed preaching of Peter, many of these things, many of these people who cried crucify were converted to Jesus Christ. So that gives me hope. I mean, I don't think these people are talking about are as bad as ones who shout crucify him and relish every bit of pain on his face. Just very quickly, before we go to a break, we have just a few moments. Give me some, just some practical, rapid fire, bullet point ways to get your young people involved in church in a meaningful way. I'm so glad you love to minister to young people. At my age, and you're much younger than me. Oh, much. We're interested <laughs> in young people because young people are the future of our church and God's work. They're going to finish the work. Quickly, few things I mentioned to you. The first thing is, the first thing is, love them genuinely in Jesus. Let them feel that. Let them know that. Let them know, for example, as a teacher, you know, I mean, Christian education is more than giving a good lecture. Right. It's the investment of ourselves in our young people. It's not just the cognitive, it's the effective. It's not just the meeting of mind with mind, but heart with heart. Because life that begins, they have to know that. And that's why, you know, in my teaching, you know, I want to follow Christ's example of teaching, and that's I am accessible. I'm an old-fashioned professor. I make house calls. Does that sound old-fashioned? That means I mingle with students as one design their good. And use Christ's approach. I mean, after that, then you discover what their talents is, what their gifts are. You lead them into witnessing. Witnessing, if they really experience leading their classmates to Christ, that's very effective. They provide opportunities to do mission work. When we send our kids overseas, they come back transformed. Because we live in a culture where everything is so provided, everything is so easy. Challenge them. Give them a cause bigger than themselves. Send them to Colombia. Send them to Honduras. And they come back appreciating Jesus, appreciating the blessings, and, and provide opportunities. And let's not focus on entertainment, okay? Youth ministry used to be defined as entertainment. They have enough entertainment in the world. That's right. Training. An army of youth, well-trained, will finish the work. Yes, it will. And we'll be right back. More with Dr. Saman and our conversation in just a moment. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000. Or you could visit us online at itiswritten.com. This is Pearl. When Pearl heard about the Eyes for India initiative, she decided she was going to take matters into her own hands. When Pearl's birthday came around, she invited all of her friends over for a birthday party, and the theme of the party was Eyes for India. She told her friends about the thousands of people in India who couldn't see, and how this critical eye surgery could change their lives. Instead of gifts, Pearl asked that her friends bring donations for this important project. Because of Pearl's influence, seven people are now able to see. Her story inspired our brand new mission kit. It's a box that has everything you need to fundraise your own project for Eyes for India. Whether it's at the front desk of your business, part of your small group, or a special church project, this kit is guaranteed to change lives. We can't wait to hear about all the creative ways you find to make this resource come to life, just like Pearl. Thanks for joining me on Conversations. My very special guest is retired professor of religion, Dr. Philip Saman. Just a moment ago, Dr. Saman, we were talking about youth ministry, but not long after you were involved in full-time youth ministry, you became a full-time missionary located in Africa. You were living in Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast. What were you uh, doing Cote there? Abidjan. I, I was working at a division office in evangelism, in promoting Sabbath school, personal witnessing, uh, to travel into many countries and train people to be able to witness and win souls for Christ. Now, you, you were in countries where 
Christianity spread rapidly. The church grew really very impressively. Of course, in the Western countries, the growth is not quite the same. What are some of the factors you believe enable the church in Africa and other parts of the world to grow, whereas perhaps in other countries, developed countries, we lag behind? What did you see there? These countries that are not developed or developing sense their need more keenly for the gospel. In the Western world, we have everything. We hear the gospel all the time on television, radio, books about it. But there, they appreciate a sermon about the gospel. They appreciate a paper about the gospel. And they take it seriously. And because life doesn't offer them much. And to them, knowing Jesus and being saved and having the hope of seeing Jesus come in the clouds of heaven, is exciting to them because of the alternative. I wish in the Western world we can appreciate the gospel as much as they do. Let me ask you then, as ministers operating in a Western context, you and I and so many others, what, do we, what need we do, what should we do to try to cut through? What's going to help us get through that, that self-satisfied life, that materialistic life? How do we reach the Western mind, as Westerners live in very challenging conditions? I wish I could ask you that question, because that's a challenging question to ask. How do you change the culture? To me, it's not really changing the culture, it's changing lives. Sure. I want Christ Asians to interact with the world around them, show them how the gospel is real, how it works. I think the other thing is, um, persecution is coming upon us gradually, maybe in small ways and later on big ways. I think that would help people feel the need for Christ. Nothing can help people feel the need for the gospel and for them to be anchored spiritually than some challenges we face. And, and even Jesus said, you know, uh, I think the Apostle Paul said, <laughs> and that is those who live a godly life those who live a transformed life will suffer persecution. And if we're not being persecuted in one way or the other, maybe we're not living a very committed life for the Lord. You see what I'm saying? So that's all I can think of. But it's a big question you're asking me. So do you think we're helping Christians today really understand what a Christian life looks like? Because it does seem that at times we tend to lower the bar. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make this anything that sounds like it's righteousness by works. But do you think that we, the church, speaking big picture, are doing an adequate job communicating to church members what discipleship really looks like? Well, you see, I don't think we are because we focus mostly on maintaining the church like a club. We become club members, and we're not taught or trained to be body members, like the Apostle Paul talked about. So therefore, our main focus, not the whole focus, the main focus is how many people can we baptize? What happens after baptism? We get excited about it. We feel successful. We don't take enough effort or planning to disciple these converts. Because the great need of the church today is not merely to add members, but to grow and multiply fruit-bearing disciples. After all, didn't Jesus say, before he went to heaven, go and make disciples? And you know something? Making disciples, I'm sorry, it's regressing to just maintain the church. But we need to focus on making disciples because the Great Commission, unfortunately, often has become the great omission. It's something we omit. Not in all places, but you know, people are so busy with their work. We have so many church programs and we like to have evangelistic meetings and baptize people. What happens afterwards is what I care about because the Great Commission should be our priority. It should never be the Great Commission and then you found yourself teaching on a college campus. Yes, sir. What was it like walking into the classroom for the first time? 
did you feel like this is where I belong or were you thinking, oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? This is where I belong. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, seeing all these young people, fresh faces, intelligent, excited. And here I come to the class and say, Lord, what a privilege you've given me to impact the lives of these young people with so much potential. And I think what helped me is following Christ's method of reaching people. Now explain Which, that. Explain well, that. you know, I mean, in one of my favorite books, Ministry of Healing, we're told that the great need of the world is for people to see Christ revealed in us. And we're told that Christ's method alone will give us genuine success. And what did he do? He mingled with people as one who desired their good. By the way, desired their good for altruistic motives, not ulterior motives. That's very important when young people know you're genuine. And the next thing you do is listen and sympathize and empathize. The third thing you do is you meet their needs, felt needs and unreal needs. And then you win their trust. Well, a lot of things can happen when you win people's trust. And then you have the chance to share Jesus with them as their Savior and Lord, someone to love and obey. And after they follow Jesus, you train them to be fishers of men. And we're told if you follow this method with prayer and God's love, it can never fail. Let me ask you this. What did you enjoy teaching? What, what did you most enjoy, not about teaching, but what did you most enjoy teaching? Well, I, you know, I teach a class in life and teachings of Jesus. I mean, that's my favorite class okay. because my favorite person is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's why I told you right now, I'm writing a book about the Middle East Messiah, a cultural perspectives of his life and teachings to, to approach some of these big ideas that we don't see because we mostly focus on the surface. So that's the class I love the most. Let me ask you this now. And I'm asking this on behalf of teachers everywhere. What did you, you've spoken about loving kids and getting beside them in the cafeteria and, and so forth. What, what did you do? What did you try to do? What did you rely on? What techniques did you have to make you a successful teacher? Well, that's an easy question to answer. All your questions are easy. Follow Christ's example of teaching. You know, we send our people to Ivy League universities to learn about teaching. People come to me and say, where did you learn how to teach this way? I said, Go, f go no further than Jesus. Wouldn't it be amazing, John, if our teachers are taught to teach like Jesus? Because he's a master teacher. So explain to me what it is to teach like Jesus. Oh, well, we just finished talking about his approach. What's his approach? Mingling with people. Wouldn't that be wonderful if students and faculty mingled together? Th th that's like a lost art, John. People look at this and say, is that possible? Of course it's possible. You mean you eat with your students in the cafeteria? Why not? What do you say to them? I mean, it's something that puzzles people. But it's really common sense, you know that? But today things become so complicated and specialized that common sense is not common anymore. So they look at this way of teaching and they think, you know, you have to go to a big university to learn it. Oh no, just learn from Jesus. Keep it simple. Learn from Jesus. Has it become more challenging over the years to teach college students? Oh, well, not for me, because I use the same approach. You know, I mean, it might be challenging, but God gives us more grace to meet the new challenge. Now that you're not in the classroom, do you miss it? Have you had time to miss it I yet? miss it. I honestly miss it. I was astonished that you, that you retired. I said, he'll never retire. Well, I astonished myself too, but you know, praying about it, the Lord impressed me. Because I just mentioned to you, to you my age, I don't want to mention it again. No, of course not. But <laughs> I keep very busy because I still teach a course now and then. Plus, I walk on campus. The leaders on campus told me, come here anytime you want. We don't believe you retire. So you know something? If I go there at 10 o'clock in the morning, I made so many friends with people and students and faculty and stuff that they talk to me. And if I'm not careful, I would miss my lunch and supper because I'm walking on campus in people's office praying, visiting and 10 o'clock in the evening comes and I look at my watch and say, I can't believe it. I've been here for 12 hours. You've referred several times to teaching Christ's way. Yes. Using Christ's method. Yes. Doing, uh, doing things God's way. Yes. And I know you've written a series of books, an excellent series of, book, of books, Christ's way. So yes. when we come back, yes. we're going to talk about your motivation uh, for writing those books and uh, how you feel God has used those books to make a difference in people's lives. More with Dr. Philip Simon on Conversations right ahead.
What does the Bible say about astrology? Why do bad things happen to good people? What color is Jesus? If you have a question, we'd love to find an answer for you from the Bible. Line up online from It Is Written TV. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800 992 2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. When people think of India, they often think of the Taj Mahal or Indian food. But what you probably won't think about is the staggering number of blind people that live in India. Sadly, more than 15 million blind call India home. And it doesn't have to be that way because many of India's blind could see again if only they could afford cataract surgery. Today, we are asking you to donate to this life-changing work. It takes just $75 to give one person the precious gift of sight. To donate, please visit our special website, itiswritten.com forward slash eyes for India, or call us. Our number is 1-844-974-8836. That's 1-844-974-8836. For only $75, you can open the eyes of the blind. Call today, 1-844-974-8836. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm John Bradshaw. My guest is Dr. Philip Saman. Dr. Saman in ministry and teaching and mission work and youth ministry and more. You have had a, a varied career. But over the last number of years, um, you've spent a little time working as an author. You've written six or seven books, uh, your Christ's Way to series. Where did the idea for that come from? Christ's Way to Pray, Christ's Way to, where did, where did that come from? Because John, there are so many ways today to do things. So I felt convicted as a young pastor to focus on Christ's way. Why? Because he is the way, the truth and the life. We cannot get better than that. So I felt impressed at the greatest spiritual need of our church is to help our people become Christ-like. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we teach our people to become Christ-like? There will be no problems if we so do things the way motivation. Jesus did, the, did them. Because there is no better way. Sure. Christ's way to pray, one of your books. What is Christ's way to pray? I don't, I, I don't want to short-circuit the process. Uh, you, 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 you will want to buy the book, but for example, Christ's way to pray. Well, the focus of the book is how we can take our measly prayers unite them to Jesus' mighty prayers, how to take our puny faith and indict it with Jesus' powerful faith. So this way our prayer life can be empowered by the life of Jesus. Do you think people are, are experiencing the power of God in their lives, the average person in the, in the pews of the average church? Where do you put that? I know this is a very subjective question, but on the scale between dead to white hot uh, in one's faith in God, where do you think average church member is average average mm -hmm. well somewhere in the middle john or toward the side of lukewarmness and you know lukewarmness is something biblical you know yeah that jesus wants us to be hot for him now in terms Not of cold. prayer you've written about this therefore you've engaged many people in conversation about this yes what do you think the frustrations are that those average christians or, or we as as christians all of us uh, coming up against when it comes to prayer. They become frustrated because they're focusing on their weakness. They're focusing on their weak prayers, feeble faith. And when they know that they can join Jesus in this sacred venture of prayer, they tell me they become really energized, empowered. They become excited. I'm not praying all by myself. It's a lonely Experience, I want to join Jesus. And isn't that exciting to know when you pray for somebody, you're not the only one praying for them, that Jesus is joining you in praying for them. That gets them excited because it gives them hope beyond what's around them. I'm not going to ask you if people pray enough. None of us do, and most people certainly don't. 
Uh, what's keeping us from praying like we should? What are the hindrances to prayer and what can people do about those? Because we expect our prayers to be answered in the way we want it, in the time we want it. But, but shouldn't we? Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So I want a shiny red sports car and I'd, I'd be good to have it before the end of the week. But just the text you quoted gives the answer. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We, we, we're not going to do it. He's going to do it. And he's wise enough to know how to do it and when to do it. So when I pray, all I do, pray in faith, then I avail myself for his answer. He is wise enough, loving enough to apply it whenever he wants. And I discover in my life that's the best way anyway. Always the best way. I think it, it, it appears to me that too many people have been taught that God and Santa Claus are much the same. If you just sit on God's knee, and ask him for a train set, you will soon have one under the tree. And God is far too wise. To you know, treat us I, you like know what that. I call this, John? When you say Santa Claus kind of prayer, is we're so used to the if yes prayer. If I pray, Jesus, yes, Jesus will give me that. But we need to learn these last days more the if not prayer. If not, that's the greatest level of prayer. The three Hebrew friends, when they're challenged by Nebuchadnezzar, you know, who is going to be the God who is going to snatch out of my eyes? Said, we know he can do it, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't. we still trust him. Anyway. That's, That's the right. kind of faith we need. We need. That's the kind of faith God wants to teach us in these Amen. last days. Amen. Tell me about another book or two in the time we have left. Well, we Christ's mentioned already to... Christ's way of reaching people. That's yeah. Christ's method. Sure. And I, I mentioned to you steps, you know, another book that's really um, ministering to people is Christ's way of affirmation. Yeah, tell me because about that. See, That's an intriguing we're title. We're not very affirming people, and we're very critical. It's not getting any better either. Right, and I'm saying, look at Jesus' example. Jesus was the kind of person who was very affirming and encouraging. He specializes in encouragement. The devil specializes in discouragement. So I thought to myself, you know, let us share with people how Jesus encourages people. Give me an example of that. You have a student coming to my office who has an F. If anybody gets an F in my class, that, that's really a miracle. I mean, that's an impossible thing to do. So he comes to me with that problem. I say, you know, John, I know you. I eat with you in the cafe. I visit in your room. We walk together on campus. Thank God he gave you a very good mind. No, I don't have a good mind. Otherwise, I get an F. No, the problem is nobody is helping use your mind the right way. Well, who's going to do it? That's what I'm here for, as your teacher. He said, well, Dr. Saman, every time I want to do well, the voice of my father tells me mm. you will never make it. Mm. I wish you were not born. I said, yes, you've been hearing this all your life. Now let's listen to another voice, the voice of your heavenly father. What does he say about you? I don't know. Let me tell you. He said, my thoughts toward you are thoughts of good, not evil. I have hope and future for you. And he said, well, how do I do it? I'm willing to do it. I said, you're smart. I know you do it. I'm going to call you this evening and review with you for the quiz. I'll keep reviewing you every week. I'll call you on the phone and we'll review it together. And I know you're going to get a grade. Thank God, the next time we had a quiz, he got 100%. And then there's a difference in the book. I talk about affirmation versus flattery. Mm -hmm. Satan counterfeits everything that Christ is about. So he counterfeits Christ's genuine affirmation with his foolish flattery. The Bible is against flattery. So you say, how do you do it? Let's say Brittany had special music Friday evening for Vespers. Beautiful voice. And I could, uh, I could flatter her by saying, you know something, Brittany? You have the sweetest voice in the world. I said, Dr. Samar Flat, you want you to do good. And you're good because it's not true. She's not the best voice in the world. This is how I would do it. I always start with God. Brittany, I heard you sing tonight. Yes, Dr. Saman? Well, let me tell you something. I'm so thankful to God. Thankful to God. Yes. Who gave you such a gift and that he allows you to use it to bless me and many others. The only response you can give me is praise God. That's right. In affirmation, we have to give credit to God. Now, you've recently em embarked on, and I, I think you're getting towards the end of writing another book, a book with a little bit of a difference, this one. Talk to me well, about Well, you that. mentioned earlier in the interview, I was born in the Middle East, in Syria. We call these lands the Bible lands. And so I'm familiar with the culture. And I've been teaching this class, Life and Teaching with Jesus, for many years. 
And I realize in our Western mindset, we just often satisfied with the surface because you don't have the culture to help us dig deeper. So in this book, we'll be looking beyond the surface and looking at Jesus' life and teachings from this cultural perspective. A young person comes to you and says, Dr. Saman, I don't know what God's will is for my life. How, how have you advised young people who've asked you that question? Mm, that's a good question. I get asked this question so many times, so many times. Uh, the promise I use, I start with a promise. And the promise is in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Mm -hmm. It all has to do with trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Now, this is a wonderful promise. And how do you apply it? Okay, so how I apply it? I befriend them. You see, I have to help them be safe with me to be themselves. So I walk with them, I eat with them, invite them to my home, and I interview, ask them all kinds of questions. What is it you like to do? What do you enjoy doing? Do you like to? All kinds of things, and it takes time. But eventually the Lord leads them to what their niche is. Because some of them are interested to do so many things. Some of them would like to measure in five things, ten things. I say to them, in this world, we need to focus on one thing, to enjoy ourselves and our ministry, to make a living. But wait, when Jesus comes, you will specialize in anything you want. So it takes a lot of conversation, a lot of investment, a lot of listening. But I know God has a plan for the student. And I know if I'm patient enough and willing to really get to know them, something will surface and we'll work with that. You've had a remarkable career in ministry and it is far from over in spite of retirement. And you have blessed us by joining me here today and sharing much of what God has placed on your heart. Dr. Philip Saman, thank you very much. I appreciate it. The blessing is mutual. I appreciate this talking to you, John. And thank you for joining us. It has been fun. He is Dr. Philip Saman. I am John Bradshaw. This has been our conversation. See you next time.